God of creation There at the start Before the beginning of time With no point of reference You spoke to the dark And fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak A hundred billion galaxies are born In the vapor of your breath The planets form And if the stars were made to worship so light I could see your heart in down my heart through all of my failure and pride on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die 
Well, good morning, Parkside Bible Church. How are you doing this morning? It is a fantastically, is that a word, fantastically? Beautiful Sunday morning. Amen? Amen. The sun is out, and I saw it's going to be 70 degrees. Woo! Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing of the Lord's amazing grace. You are 
eyes and turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face, and the things of her will grow strangely dim in the seated. So much in such a short period of time. That was wonderful. Singing together as we worship our Lord, recognize what he's done for us, and celebrate that as a community. Wonderful job singing together. We've got a, a few important things coming up to draw your attention to as a community, as we've just worshiped, and we'll continue to worship uh, into the rest of our service. Another place that we have to worship is service and places to be involved in different ministries. Uh, before we get into that, though, if you're visiting with us, there is a visitor card right in front of you in the pew. You can fill that out the front portion and place that in our offering, uh, which will be coming through in just a few moments. There's also a spot on the back for a, a place to put prayer requests. If you have any of those, you can place those in the offering as well. Uh, this way we can get to know you, but also be able to pray for you. The prayer request spot is for anybody, uh, but in the front part is specifically for visitors too. Uh, so make sure you fill that out and take advantage of that. We'd love to get to know you more. In a few weeks, uh, speaking of getting to know you, we do have a getting to know you class that will launch the last Sunday in April. Uh, so if you are interested in Parkside, knowing more about who we are and some of the fundamentals of what make us Parkside, uh, come to that class to hear more about us. It's also a step towards uh, membership as well. It's a requirement for membership is taking that class. So if you'd uh, like to know more information about that, talk to one of us. But a sign-up will be available next Sunday as well. I do have a picture on the screen from, this is from yesterday. This is one chunk of the huge group of people that showed up to help over the last couple of days to get our grounds looking good for springtime. And I think we even ushered in springtime because it looks so beautiful outside. Uh, we had another 20 plus people on Friday night beyond this group of people that was here Saturday uh, to help get our grounds ready to put new mulch down, but also just doing various jobs of cleanup. Um, and if you're here and you helped either Friday or Saturday, could you stand up? And we'd love to recognize you as a community. Thanks for all your work there. So if you were here Friday or Saturday to help, stand on up. Yeah, thank you. I saw some kids standing up too, but they're not tall enough to look like they're standing up. But there were some kids standing up too. Uh, so uh, next year, be on the lookout for cleanup days. It's just an honor to serve side by side, rubbing shoulders with each of you, and it was just an awesome day. Uh, it really happened quickly. Uh, many hands make light work, and that's exactly what happened. So thanks for your involvement there. And if you'd like to clean up more stuff, I'm sure there's stuff you can clean up anytime. Uh, also, uh, an important thing today, if you have pledge cards that you have not turned in for our missions fund, make sure you turn that in today. If you left yours at home or don't have one or forgot about that, we do have some on the Welcome Center as well. But today, after Family Bible Hour, the missions committee is meeting to put together the budget for the rest of the fiscal year for missions. And it's really dependent on a lot of those pledge cards. We're zeroing in on our goal of 63,000. Uh, we're within 10,000 of that, but we still need that last little push to get all the way up to 63,000. So if you're able and if you uh, like to pledge towards missions, make sure you fill out that pledge card and get that to uh, Rob Caldwell or in the offering this morning and we'll be able to count that as we plan for the future. Uh, there's also new family Bible uh, <laughs> family Bible hour classes that will start in a couple of weeks. Make sure you're available and aware of those things. Some of the classes are still continuing for the last little chunk of the springtime, uh, but we'll give you more information about that too. And make sure if you have any questions about anything going on, you consult your bulletin. This is almost a full-time staff member, so make sure you know what's going on here by being aware of what's going on in your bulletin. As we think about ministry opportunities too, and as we think about what's coming up, even what's coming up right after the service, there's a temptation to rush ahead to those things. But rather than rushing ahead into ways of serving later, let's be present right now. And before we pray to continue our worship service, I'd love to just have a few moments of silence as we reflect on who Christ is and what he's done for us. It might be awkward, silence is sometimes awkward, but it's good for us to calm and be still before God. So let's be still before him for a few moments.
Father, in a world of busyness and noise, silence speaks volumes. We're grateful that we can non-anxiously come before you and rest in who you are, knowing that you have been faithful in the past and you will continue to be faithful into eternity. Thank you for your son, which is your love displayed for us. Thank you for your spirit, which is our comfort moment by moment. And as we think about who you are and the majesty of your name, we give you all the praise and all the glory. Thank you that we can be still and silent before you and not have to rush around to control things, but rest in your sovereignty. We give you this morning and every moment after. In your son's name we pray, amen. Would you stand as we continue to worship? i 
before we go into this next song, I wanted to talk about it for a minute because it's one of my favorite songs. It's called The Goodness of God. It's a good one. Um, and I, I love this song because it talks about God's faithfulness and declares his mercy. Um, I was reminded, I've been in um, Psalm 23 study for several months, and we ended with Psalm 23, verse 6. And it says, David declares, Surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, King David went through a lot. He knew, he knew the Lord's faithfulness and his mercy in his life. Sometimes the Lord brings us to a place that doesn't make sense. We go down roads that aren't fun, valleys that are really deep and hard. Whew. But if we follow his voice, allow him to lead us there, holding our hands, right? We will see and experience his goodness, and we will see and experience his faithfulness, and we will see and experience his mercy. Because his mercy doesn't just follow us, it chases us all the days of our lives. And he is good and he is merciful, no matter what. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Let's sing this song together.
give a shout out to the Lord this morning. Allow his mercy and his faithfulness and his goodness follow you and chase you all the days of your life. You may be seated. Well, good morning, Parkside. It's time for the uh, ushers to come down front, please, to prepare for the morning offering at that same time. That means that it's time for all kids ages three through fifth grade to head down front and uh, get ready to go off to Kids Church. So for those who are new here, like I said, three to fifth grade is Kids Church. For those up through kindergarten, they're gonna be right outside the door here to the left with Miss Jen, really close uh, by in the nursery entrance right there is their classroom. The older kids, because they get so rowdy, we're all the way at the farthest one from uh, this point, and that's at the end of the hallway down there, just past the multi-purpose room. But welcome, guys. You guys came down front a little slower this week than usual. I thought you would certainly be inspired by that last song. God's goodness is running after you. Well, make sure you make him run fast, right? Yeah, as you get down here. So let's pray and get ready to head off to class, okay? Father God, we thank you so much for this group of youngsters down front here this morning, Lord. We pray that uh, they come to understand uh, the knowledge of salvation that they have in you, Lord. We pray that for those who have already accepted you, that they continue to go strong in their faith, rely on you more and more every day. Father, we thank you so much for the gift that each of these kids are, uh, the reminder of us, that uh, of your faithfulness that we have in them, Lord, in their presence here in our church family. We also pray for this time of offering, Father. We pray uh, we thank you so much for the many blessings that we've, you've given us. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us uh, financially as well, and we pray now that uh, this can be just a humble offering to you, Lord, and the amazing things that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, guys.
together declaring we can remember that you are working all things out for your own good, Lord. We thank you for this time. May it continue to bring you honor and glory this morning. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. He is coming. He is coming indeed. If you could turn this down just a little bit, Chris, yeah. we're glad that you're here this morning, especially with the last 24 hours, things have changed, and we're really glad that you're here this morning to worship. What a wonderful opportunity through music uh, to be able to proclaim these great truths that we were able to proclaim this morning. Thank you to Kaylee and to the worship team. I do want to uh, recognize somebody who's here for the first time, I believe, and we usually don't do this, but... Um, I think it's pretty special when a baby comes to church for its first time, and they don't only come and sit in the back, they sit right in the front. I love that. And we just want to say to uh, Ari, James, and they do, he's here for the first time. Adam and Kelly, welcome. Could you, uh, could we just for a moment just enjoy, is he uh, awake? Yeah, could you just hold him up so that we could say... Good morning to Ari James for the first time. Why don't we welcome Ari James and just say welcome to, to Ari James. <laughs> and if he cries, that's fine, Kelly, okay? I just think it's good that we bring our children to church on a regular basis from day one. And that's really, really important. November 5th, 2024 is about 206 days away. Are you looking forward to it? It's election year, and we are coming to another point in our history where things are changing even within the last 24 hours. If you haven't watched the news, uh, Israel has been attacked quite severely by Iran. Some hundreds of missiles have been directed uh, towards the nation of Israel within the last... 12 hours, 15 hours, and here we sit huh, with the world changing all, all around us. The Bible is full of admonition and it's full of teaching 
about the biblical God-ordained rule of government. It's, I think, unique that we are in the text that we are in today, in this moment, as we walk through the book of Romans verse by verse. We started the book of Romans I haven't checked my file. It's probably been a year and a half, almost two years now that we've been in the book of Romans. We started in Romans chapter 1, verse 1, and we've been walking through the book of Romans. And we have learned about justification through faith. We've learned about the spirit indwelling us and changing us, the spiritual work that God is doing individually and corporately. We've learned about what the nation of Israel and what the nation of Israel is doing, Romans 9, 10, and 11, Three chapters that basically say bottom line is keep your eye on Israel because God is not done with the nation of Israel. God is, uh, Israel is God's chosen people. They might not be obedient to him today, but there's a day coming when he comes back to the Mount of Olives and he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives and he comes into the city of Jerusalem and he establishes a kingdom that the world is yearning for and looking for and waters will come to an end. Romans 9, 10, and 11. And then we come to Romans chapter 12 and chapter 13, and what Paul does is he takes our faith and he says, your faith is not just a head faith, your faith is a faith that is lived out in the way that you live. Put your faith to work. And it happens in the church, it happens in the world, and it happens in government. It's unique that Paul will take almost two paragraphs and write about political issues and how the Christian is to respond to political issues. We need not separate government and the pulpit. And having said that, there's some principles that come out of the word of God that will hopefully help us in understanding our role to government. And for some of you that are in government and some of you that need to get into government, what is your role as a government official? Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. What I'd like to do this morning is share with you four general principles that come from this text. And we'll look at these four kind of briefly because we dealt with some of it last week. It's a little bit of a review, but also a little bit more of a development of some of the principles here in the scriptures about government. And then secondly, I'd like to share with you some principles that help us as believers when we need to say no to the government. How do we do that? What's our posture as believers? And we'll look at a number of ways that will hopefully help us in the posture of how to say no to the government. Romans chapter 13, begin with verse 1. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. The first principle that we see from this text is that all authority, all authority, all authority, don't miss this, all authority is of God and is under God's sovereign rule and plan. We call him king of kings and lord of lords for a reason. Because kings are rulers. Lords are rulers. Presidents are rulers. He's the lord and he's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. And all authority is under his rule and reign. Jesus Christ rules and reigns over all institutions of authority. What institutions of authority has God established? Basic from the very beginning, a family with a man and a woman in the garden to reproduce and to fill the earth. And it can only happen between a man and a woman to bring that reproduction together. And the family becomes the institution that is the foundation, if we could say, of all other institutions. Because it is here in the family where we learn from day one. We learn from day one right and wrong. And let's make sure that we've got a good theology about our babies. 
they're corrupt from day one. They're cute, but they're corrupt because we've been born into this sin nature and the authority that God has placed for humanity really begins in the home where both a man and a woman feed into the heart of this child and we find the greatest place of molding and melting the hearts of other people to influence other people, it happens in the home. Dads and moms together working in this institution called the family. The Ten Commandments that we're familiar with, the first four, deal with our relationship with God. And then commandment number five, obey your parents in the Lord. Where do we learn to be obedient to mom and dad? We learn not to kill. The next commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Where do we learn that? We watch mom and dad. Where do we learn the next commandment? Thou shalt not steal from mom and dad. Where do we learn the commandment of not bearing false witness from mom and dad? Where do we learn to not covet from mom and dad? And we learn this early on. The institution of the family has been established by God in the fifth commandment, right in the middle of the Ten Commandments, the law of God that reveals the heart of God and reveals the sinfulness of man. The law is still holy and faithful to God's word. And so we find that the institution of the family is an institution that is foundational for us understanding the when we obey our parents we are being obedient to God's authority the bible says in the new testament children obey your parents in the lord for this is right honor your father and your mother which is the first commandment colossians chapter 3 verse 20 Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Obeying parents is obeying God's authority. When we say no to mom and dad, and we flip our finger up and say, no, we're not going to do that, that's a form of disobedience to the authority that God has established. It reminds me of a story I heard not too long ago. One Sunday in a Midwest city, a young child was acting up during the morning worship hour. The parents did their best to maintain some sense of order in the pew, but they were losing the battle. And finally, the father picked the little fella up and he walked sternly up the aisle on his way out. And just before reaching the safety of the foyer, the little fella cried loudly to the congregation, pray for me, pray for me. <laughs> Why did he pray one prayer? Because he knew that there were consequences to him not listening. There's a sense in which, good for you, Dad. He brings them into church. That's where he belongs. That's where she belongs. We need to bring our kids back into this experience. There's times and places where this separation of silos that we have built, even in our churches, we need to bring the families back together. Dads, show by example how to worship, not just singing, but how to sit quietly before God and to be silent before him. I value so much sitting down the pew when I was a child with my three brothers and looking down at dad sitting on the end, being a part of our worship experience, not only on Sunday mornings, but Sunday nights. A little boy was overheard praying this prayer, Lord, if you can't make me better, a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a real good time just like I am. And if that isn't the prayer of the heart that has been conceived in sin, we need to teach our children right and wrong in the doctrine of total depravity. We are bent, when we come into the world, we are bent towards self. We are bent towards my ways. We are bent towards me, myself, and I. And we are bent away from God. And we take our eyes off. Look upon Jesus. That's what salvation is all about. Oftentimes we use Proverbs 22, verse 6, I believe falsely. We look at Proverbs 22, 6 as a promise. Train up the child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And we, we claim that as a promise. I don't believe that's a promise. That's a warning. 
train up the child that he or she wants to go. What's that way? What's the way that they want to go when they're born into the world? They want to do it themselves. If we train them and let them go the way that they want to go, don't put any boundaries around your kids. Don't ever discipline your kids. And when I use the word discipline, make sure that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not talking about abuse, but I'm talking about loving discipline that is firm and consistent. Train your child up in a way that he will go, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. That's a warning. I don't believe that's a promise. And that's why some people, they say, well, I've raised my child good, and God promises this, so I'm standing on the promise, and God's going to bring my kids back. Well, maybe not. Maybe not. And we find that the institution of the family becomes the foundation. There's a second authority that we saw last week, and that's the authority of the church. We are commissioned to share the gospel and to point people to Christ. The authority of the church is to support the home. We are not to train the kids. The kids are under the rule and the authority of mom and dad. That's their responsibility. The church comes alongside and gives them the tools for spiritual insight into the word of God. And the commission of the church is to share the gospel. By the way, we'll get to this in a moment. That is not the calling of government. The calling of government is not necessarily to share the gospel. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But it's important for us to see what authorities have been given and their responsibilities. And the church has been given the responsibility of sharing the gospel. This is World Magazine that just came out this past week. Fascinating article. The debate over Christian nationalism. Where, where Christians want to make the country Christian. And so this Christian nationalism has become a hot topic. There's an article in here entitled, The Battle for America's Identity. Does Christian nationalism hold the key to the country's past and its future? Are we out in the government to try and make this a Christian nation? I'll read just the last few paragraphs of this article that I found very helpful because there is a separation of responsibilities between church and state. And here's what this author quotes. A.J. Nolt, an associate pastor at Regent University, and an Anglican priest has spent years studying the historical and political effects of religious nationalism in countries around the globe. Nolt says progressives have no qualms equating Christian nationalism with white supremacy and theocracy because it alienates people from aligning with conservatives. They want to frighten people into thinking, quote, all Christians have extreme beliefs, he says. Nolt commends the desire to use politics to elevate Christian causes and influence government, but... He warns against conflating church and state. Quote, as Christians, we need to keep the main thing the main thing. Focus on the gospel. He says he worries that if the church starts acting like the state, it will eventually stop acting like the church. That's good stuff. He also notes non-believers, and listen to this, non-believers and the media elites aren't blind to the division the emphasis on Christian nationalism is causing among believers. Nolt urges Christians not to take the bait. Quote, it's a sucker's game. You risk getting distracted from the things that actually matter, end of quote. The church is called to preach the gospel where people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our mission. That is not the mission of the, church, or of the state. The government is not called to do that. This institution has authority by God who has placed individuals in places of authority to proclaim the gospel and the truth of the word of God. We need to understand that because this Christian nationalism gets really fuzzy. And there's two groups of people on, on this side within the church that can cause division between us as to what is the role of government. We are the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors for Christ. Paul calls us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
And hopefully, if you're in this church and you're even listening by way of live stream, we want you to know every Sunday, we want you to know that Christ died for you. God loves you. And we want as a church not to proclaim it here, but we want to proclaim it out there. I want to make sure that you've got the gospel in uh, front of your mind so that when you go out and you talk to people, you will know what the gospel is. It's not being good. Your goodness won't get you to heaven. Attending church won't get you to heaven. Don't let your religiosity keep you from the eyes of seeing the face of Christ. Turn your eyes upon Christ because we embrace the cross. That's what we sang. The cross is where you and I were forgiven. And you and I need to put our faith and our trust in him. Somewhere, somehow, if you've been brought up in the church, you have a place. Don't tell me that I've always been a Christian. I ask people, well, how do you know you're saved? Oh, I was raised in a Christian home. So? That doesn't get you to heaven. You just had a nice environment of godly influence, hopefully from mom and dad. Good for you. Use it. But don't let that be the tool and the ticket to heaven. What's the ticket to heaven? See, and here's where religion can really be a stumbling block. I don't need a savior because I'm so good. And our very goodness becomes the very stumbling block that says, I'm fine. I don't need a savior. If you're 65, if you're 85, and you're still coming to church, and you haven't made a step of faith where you've said, I know that I'm a sinner. I was born into this world, separated from God. That's Romans chapter 3. Chapter 4, we're justified by faith. You believe the promises of God. You take God at his word. All of that becomes the gospel. And this institution of the church is where we proclaim the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today and you will be saved. Going back to Romans chapter 12, I'm sorry, no, chapter 13. Look at verse uh, 2 and 3. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority, rebels against the authorities, against what God has instituted is in those who will bring judgment on themselves for rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. The third institution that we find God has put into place is the institution of government. With the principles here that come out of this, just to try and keep it simple, here's one of the basic responsibilities of government, I believe, from this text and from others. Government is authorized by God to uphold the law of God to protect its citizens from harm. The government is responsible for its citizens to live in an environment where their lives are not being threatened and they can live out their lives as husband and wife and children and education and worship and all that the government oversees, their primary role is to protect its citizens. Period. There's another passage of scripture here that gives indication to this. 1 Timothy chapter 2. Would you turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2? And here the Apostle Paul deals with government again. And notice what he does in this text as he trains this young Timothy for ministry within the church. What about government? And Paul brings it up in his discussion here in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let me go back to verse 18. And just get the context, because our chapters and verses are man-made. This is a letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, beginning in verse 18, chapter 1. Timothy, my son, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle well. Friends, we're in a battle. We are in a spiritual battle. And the language that the uh, scriptures use is that this is no walk in the park. This is a spiritual battle, and Timothy is reminded of that here in these verses. Holding on to the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. 
and so have suffered shipwrecked with regard to their faith. There's some that have shipwrecked their faith. Among them, verse 20, are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Boy, this is just some really strong language. Notice what Paul does in the next verse. Take away the chapter. He keeps, he keeps encouraging Timothy. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, verse 2, for kings and all those in authority. And here's where we find Paul making mention. Why do we pray for those in authority? And Paul doesn't say just pray for the good ones because the ones that we agree with. No, 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 no. Remember from last week, all authorities have been placed in positions of authority. Think about Moses. Think about some of the people that, that God used by way of Moses and Pharaoh. God placed Pharaoh into that position because God chose to use him. The Babylonians, Nebuchadnezzar, an evil empire that God used for his good. Notice in verse 2 here that we pray for these that are in authority. That we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Boy, when government provides an environment for people to live peaceful and quiet lives, not just to feed our appetites. No, look at what Paul says here. We are not to feed our appetites because we've got this freedom and this silence that the government gives us. No, no, no. For the believer, it is that we might live godly and holy lives. And this, my friend, pleases God, puts a smile on his face. So when governments allow us to live those peaceful and quiet lives, there's a sense that it brings joy to the heart of God and it brings joy to the people of God because they are doing what God has commanded and given us the privilege of doing. And so we pray for them on a regular basis because this is the responsibility of government. Going back to Romans chapter 13, look at verse 4, a third principle in here. We find here that in verse 4, Paul calls them servants of God. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. The third principle here that we find in this passage is that government leaders are God's servants. They're God's servants, good ones and bad ones. And I'm not saying that we need to let the bad ones do the bad things. No, they need to be held accountable for their actions because someday they will stand before God and be judged for how they governed. And did they provide safety for the citizens? Did they uphold the laws to protect? And that's what the law does. It protects us. They hold the sword, or can I put it this way? They hold the gun to protect us. When you and I are breaking the law going 85 miles down the highway, I guarantee you that the rear view mirror becomes a priority. Why? Because I know I'm breaking the law and I hope that they don't see this. And usually when I'm going that fast and I see a police officer in front of me, what's my natural response? When my foot comes off, whoop, hi officer. When I was a young man, I uh, was, pulled over, uh, was pulled over at 12.30 a.m. in the morning by a police officer, and he pulled me over for drunk driving. Um, I was in love with a girl that lived down in Garden Grove, Sue Gardner at the time. I was working at Steelcase, getting up at 4.30 in the morning to work at 6, and I would stay at her house and be with her family until midnight, and then I'd go home and I'd get three hours of sleep. I fell asleep behind the wheel. And I don't know what happened, but I, I do remember going past Temple Baptist Church there in La Habra, and I just found myself about a half mile up the road, stopped at a, a, at a light, and the policeman was behind me. And so when he pulled me over, he said, get out of the car, I'd like you to walk on the curb. Because he thought that I was drunk. I wasn't drunk, I said, sir, I'm just lacking sleep. I just need to sleep, I think I fell asleep behind the wheel. You don't need to give me a DUI. You probably need to give me a DWS, drinking while sleeping. 
Uh, but what he did is he let me go, and I was able to go home and get the rest that I want. But he had the authority, and he had rightfully the authority to pull me over because I was harming myself and putting myself in harm's way. But here's the other thing. I was putting you in harm's way. And it's one thing to run up the curb. It's another thing to run over somebody because we're disobeying the law. And what the law is, is the law is there to protect us. We need to teach our children. We need to teach them to respect the authority that when we get pulled over, we say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. We treat the authorities. Why? Because they are servants of God. They are there because God has ordained them. And we find that that's obedience to God. And now we come to verse 5, and we find this principle. And here's what many of us are really anxious to get to, because just out of our sin nature, we're, we're, we really are rebels at heart. So I want to know when and where I can say no. Get to that stuff real quick, because that's what we want to do. We want to know where's the line where when the government says don't do this, how do we respond? And here's what Paul says in verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. And he begins this paragraph with submission, and he ends the paragraph with submission, and there's a submission theme here that is the undercurrent of what we're going to talk about here in these next few moments. Because here's where the rubber meets the road. What happens when the authorities that are above us ask us or tell us to do something that is contrary to the law of God? And here's where it gets a little messy. And can I suggest that before we go into these six principles of our posture of dealing with this, that we recognize that some of this is our attitude towards authority is going to show on how we resist by saying no. And we've got to be very careful. We are walking into some turf here that is extremely holy. So be careful. We need to be careful on how we say no. Here's the principle that I'd like to share with you. Believers are called and commanded to humbly, respectfully, and graciously say no to authority that asks us to live contrary to God's ultimate authority. Let me repeat that again. Believers are called and commanded to humbly, respectfully, and graciously say no to authority that asks us to live contrary to God's ultimate authority. And this becomes the principle here where how do we do this? What's the posture? Let me share six steps. They're kind of in progression. Thanks to Vodi Bakum and some of his teaching, I've stolen some of these thoughts from him, but I believe it's, it's right and it's biblical. So here are the six principles. Number one, we've already seen this, we need to pray. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, our first step is that we need to be people of prayer when we pray for these authorities that rule over us. We need to pray for moms and dads. We need to pray for the church. We need to pray for our government officials. Why? Because there is authority that has been established in all of these institutions of God. We pray for the kings, the, pre the presidents that govern over us because their hearts are literally in the hand of God. And we pray for two things. We pray that God will change their heart or take their heart. One of the two. But we pray for those that govern over us. Prayer is a mighty instrument, not for getting man's will done in heaven, but for getting God's will done here on earth. And we need to be people of prayer. And I commend you because many of you here at Parkside, you say to me almost weekly, I'm praying for you in the church. And what we probably need to do is continue to say to one another, I'm praying for you in the church and for our government officials. Yeah, but I don't like them. Doesn't matter. You don't have to like them. I might not like them either. 
they don't earn their respect for us to support them. There is no governing authority, even in the family, that is due our respect. A wife that says to her husband, I will respect you when you show me that you love me. Uh-uh. You're going to wait a long time because there's not one man that walks his face of the earth that's going to show the kind of respect that desires you to, or the kind of love that gives you the respect to give that man. There's only one man that walked the face of the earth that could do that. And when you obey your husband, you're being obedient to the authority that God has placed over that home. So we pray. Secondly, we model we model humility and we model submission. A passage that I want you to be familiar with and aware of in this conversation. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. This is another classic passage of scripture that deals with government and how we are to respond to government. And Peter here, like Paul, says some things that are very common to their conversation about this theme. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, remember that our citizenship is in the heavens. Last week we saw that from Philippians 3. Our citizenship is in the heavens to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. We are in a battle. There is just full of language here that we are in a spiritual battle. We need to get over this fluffy stuff that sometimes we think about the Christian life as, oh, those are for these softies that don't have any backbone. No, 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 no. The church is in a spiritual battle with forces, and we find the language here yet again of Peter. Verse 12, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Then look at what he says in verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. Some of the same language of Romans chapter 13. Look at verse 16. Uh, verse 15, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant, ignorant talk of foolish people. You and I are to live lives, model Christ's likeness in our response to authority. And this becomes really important. Sticking our chest out and saying, I'm going to oppose you and have this prideful attitude. Boy, listen to me and look at how Christian I am because I'm standing for truth. Be careful. Because the attitude in which we come, we need to model a spirit of humility and a spirit of submission. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 8. Take Christ as the example. Christ becomes the example of how we are to live our lives, not only with government, not only with church, but within our own homes. To have a spirit of humility and of grace. To have that mind that was in Christ. To have that same mind in us as we live out our faith. Number three, we're not only to pray and to model, but now we come to a third way of saying no to government, and that is that we appeal our case. We appeal our case. Moses before Pharaoh. What did Moses do when he went before Pharaoh? Let my people go. He was appealing that Moses makes to Pharaoh that, Moses, that Pharaoh would let the people, people go. Daniel, in Daniel chapter 1, when Daniel is told to eat the food, and he says, no, this is what the Bible says, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief officer for permission not to defile himself this way. He makes an appeal for his case. Paul's appeal to Caesar in Acts chapter 25, Paul before Festus. Paul makes an appeal, I want to take my case to Caesar. To Caesar, your case will go. Acts chapter 25. This past week, I had a lady that's been attending our church just briefly uh, come into my office, and she shared an experience that she had 
a number of years ago, back in 1987, where she had an experience where she saw evil in a store where pornography, back in the 80s, this was pretty common. You go into a store and there's pornography that was standing there right in the store. And she saw this little five-year-old boy with the hand of a parent standing right in front of this stand and she was convicted like that's not right. And so she went to the city and she made an appeal. And there's an article in the newspaper back in the Kalamazoo Gazette on Wednesday, November 11th, 1987, where they finally changed the law. And how long did it take for them to change the law? 10 years until that appeal became a reality. And I'll just read the last paragraph of Patty Gell's experience. She presented the council with the names of 200 Portage residents who signed a petition in support of her effort. By signing the petition, Jell said, I believe the residents of our community are saying, enough. Jell said that most Portage businesses have already taken steps to keep adult magazines from minors. Now pornography is not in our stores, it's on our computers and it's on our phones. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Making the appeal is also in the Bill of Rights. Our government has been established. The First Amendment gives us this proper step of appeal. Let me just read the First Amendment for you. Congress shall make no law representing an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble. And listen to this, the last phrase and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Within our own constitution, the men that established our government attempted to even allow there to be an appeal process that you and I have when we have things that we don't agree with. I'm not afraid, I'm not, I'm not sure, friends, that getting our guns out and putting signs up and picketing is going to really do a whole lot. We need to pray, we need to model, we need to make the appeal to the right people in government places. And what you find in the scriptures is when these people made their appeal, there was a relationship that they had with this individual that they knew their authority and they brought their appeal before them. We need to do, I believe, the same. Number four, there's also a time as we progress in these steps, there's also a place where we need to confront. In all due respect, let's confront with respect and a spirit of humility. Even the confronting needs to be done in a spirit as such. Think of, think of Nathan back in 2 Samuel chapter 12 when Nathan confronted David in his sin. I just love the way that Nathan did this. He didn't just barge himself into the room and say, David, sit down, I've got to tell you something. <laughs> Nathan even showed grace by telling him a parable story. And when David heard the story, he says, who is this man that would do such a thing? And Nathan pointed the finger and said, David, it's you. And I see here in the confrontation a spirit of grace that Nathan gave to David as he tells him the sin that he was involved in the sin with Bathsheba. John the Baptist before Herod did the same in Matthew 14 verse 4. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife and he confronted Herod in that situation. Paul in Acts 22, 25, they were ready to flog David, uh, flog uh, Paul. And as they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't been found guilty? And he confronts the evil that was being done. We pray, we model, we appeal, we confront. Fifth, there's a time for us to resist. In all due respect, we resist. The example of Exodus chapter 1, verse 15, Shifra and Pua, the two midwives that were told take the baby boys and kill them and let the baby girls live. And these two midwives said, no. We fear God and we're not going to do that. 
And there's a time and a place for us to resist. Daniel in the decree that was given that you should not pray except to Darius. And if you pray to any other source, you'll get thrown into the lion's den. And the Bible tells us that when David learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. There's a time and a place where we graciously, humbly, we say no. And then sixth and finally, there's a step of fleeing authority. The apostle Paul, when he went into cities, he did one of two things. He either created a riot or there was a revival. And many times they asked him to leave, so he fled, oftentimes, for his own safety. Sometimes when we're run out of town, sometimes what we do is we flee. And like our ancestors, at least I see that the nation that we are a part of, yes, we broke away from the nation on the other side of the pond. And what we did is we established a government here. I think that that was a right statement. It was biblical in the way that they handled themselves and conducted themselves, even for the appeals that they tried to make to the government there. But sometimes there's a time and a place where we flee and we start another country. The pilgrims that came here landed in Plymouth Rock in 1620. They were separatist. They believed that the Church of England was so worldly and corrupt that they had to separate from it and establish their own church, one which was true to biblical principles. They were not allowed to form their own church in England, so they first went to Holland, not Holland, Michigan, but to Holland, and then they came here to America. I didn't know this, but that the Puritans agreed with the pilgrims that the Church of England was worldly and corrupt, it was to lineate with regard to vice and heresy. However, they believed that they should stay in the church to purify it, Puritans. The title Puritan defined their cause. In contrast to the pilgrims, Puritans didn't object to the concept of a state church. They came to America to establish a state church and run it strictly according to the commands of God. And there is times where we need to flee because of the authorities' decisions that go contrary to the word of God. Can I just close with some encouragement as we are living in some unique days today? Things are going to continue to heat up, and I don't say that to try and alarm, but as you're watching the news and you're watching things that are happening, our, the world is changing rapidly overnight. As we, the church, continue to try and stand for biblical truths, I believe that these principles are important for us to consider in our relationship with our government. That right now, I've got to be honest with you, our government is going in a direction that I think many of us never dreamed that we would see some of the policies and the principles that are anti-home and anti-church and even their responsibilities to be government officials that they're abusing their government authority and not doing what the scriptures teach and share that they should be doing. There are consequences, my friends, for those of us that will stand against the authorities of the world that are anti-God. Many of you, like me, I get this on a regular basis, the voice of the martyrs. I'll read the back of the page here. Christians in restricted nations like China, Iran, Libya, Afghanistan, North Korea, Egypt, Sudan, face continual risk of persecution by governments that oppose their faith. And in hostile areas like Indonesia, Colombia, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, Believers are persecuted by extreme groups, family members, and community members. Within these hostile areas and restricted nations, efforts are growing to suppress or eradicate any witness to Christ. Yet our brothers and sisters have remained faithful at great personal cost. 
And I think we need to be very careful here, friends, that when we move into these steps of resistance, that we consider those that have gone before us and we do this with a spirit of humility, spirit of grace, and a spirit of submission to ultimate authority to God. But we need to do this with a humble spirit. Many of those that have gone before us have lost their liberty, they've lost their possessions, and many of them have lost their life. And we need to be careful that we who live in a country that has never ever, I believe, in the world of human history, had the kind of freedoms that we have, in this responsibility that we have to be able to live in a land in a constitutional representative republic like we have, that we be good citizens. And we take advantage of the voting that we have. We take advantage of being obedient to these authorities that God has placed over us. But we do it with humility and grace. In Hebrews chapter 11, which we don't have time to turn to, it's the uh, subject of faith. It's what many people call the faith chapter. It's not the faith chapter. The word death is used more times in Hebrews chapter 11 than faith. It's the martyrdom chapter. When God's people live by faith, there's consequences. And most of the people that have stood for the principles of God's authority over all the other authorities have paid a price. If you don't believe me, look at the 12 disciples. Both Peter and Paul were martyred in Rome about 66 AD during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his request since he did not feel worthy to die in the same manner as his Lord. There's consequences to some of the stands that we take. Are we willing to stand for the truth of God's word? I pray that in the days to come that there will be a spirit of Christ-likeness as we potentially have to resist government and if we do it, we pray, we model, we appeal, we confront, we resist, and maybe we even flee to heaven's gates. Show respect and show honor in the way that we conduct ourselves as believers in the days to come. This morning, in view of some of what has happened from last night, I've written out a prayer for us in closing. I'd like us to stand this morning in conclusion of our service, if you would stand with me. And can I express in prayer to God's throne this prayer of grace over us as we leave here this morning? Our Heavenly Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator of all things, and Savior of the world through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we bow in humble submission to your sovereign reign over all things in heaven and on earth. For such a time as this, we pray for your provision and protection for your chosen people, Israel. Give wisdom to Bibi Netanyahu and to Gantz and to Gallant as meetings and decisions concerning response to last night's attack on Israel take place. Father, may your will be done as the stage is being prepared for the return of your son to the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem to bring peace and stability to a world in desperate need of both. Father, would you grant your church, the body of Christ, the wisdom and insight into the authorities established by your wise counsel, the family, the local church, Parkside Bible Church, and to our government. Raise up local government officials that will serve us by protecting us and allowing us to live out our faith in a peaceful and quiet way. May we, the church, fulfill the greatest commission of being ambassadors of the gospel, sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Father, inform and ignite our government leaders to put 
a dome of protection around our streets in our neighborhoods, that you would take pleasure in being worshiped and acknowledged by our offering of praise in living out our faith. Father, you have given your son to redeem us. May we in return offer ourselves to you the least we can do in response to such a love, such a gift, such a savior. Grant us, your people, Father, courage for the day, a humble, respectful, submissive, Christ-like spirit that reflects your heart to the praise and the glory of your name. We ask these things, Father, in Jesus' name. Maranatha. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. May God be with you this week. Keep your eyes up. He is coming. He's coming indeed. Make sure you shake a hand before you leave. You're dismissed. <laughs>